So I want to tell you about our attempts to get the new GeoSnap detector that you heard about from Danny earlier today on Sky. And I should really credit um, our partners in this at the University of Arizona, in particular, Jaron Lysenring, who is the PI of this project at U of A, um, working in tandem with us uh, being led at the University of Michigan. Uh, I mentioned this in the discussion the other day, just to remind folks, I don't think I need to convince this audience that it is valuable to have adaptive optics assisted mid infrared imaging, but um, some people do wonder in the era of JWST, and I won't go over the detail again, simply to say that for bright targets at modest lambda over D, say less than eight, uh, we believe with good AO and proper coronography, we can beat JWST in the contrast limit. And I think that's been well demonstrated by a few recent papers. Um, I also shouldn't waste time going over the detector development that Danny already talked about. I'm happy to try to answer more questions or, or defer them to Danny if you are interested in more detail. And let me get to the heart of the matter. So um, some of you will have heard of MIRAC before. It is a many generational mid-infrared camera uh, that started out at one, two, and three on the MMT and other telescopes, including the IRTF back in the day. Um, the uh, MIRAC-4 was stalled with a, a um, array that didn't work as well as people hoped uh, from DRS engineering. And now we have a new chance to revive it with the GeoSnap detector. So our plan is to take it to both the MMT and Magellan. Uh, they are both adaptive optics assisted facilities, the F-15 at the MMT and the F-17 uh, at Magellan. Uh, we will focus our use on pyramid wavefront sensors, hopefully going down to, uh, uh, at least with the MMT, down to magnitudes less uh, brighter than 12th. And as you heard, we have our GeoSnap detector with rather high QE, 65%. Again, that's without anti-reflection coding. And even with the one over F noise that you heard about, we believe this will make a significant step forward in our ability to uh, do AO-assisted imagery from the ground. With the detector format that we have, even if it's only the one quadrant, we have a 28 arc second field of view. And that is even when we're sampling the diffraction limit at a factor of 10 over sampling. And that's important for our high contrast application. Um, we will, in principle, the detector can operate down to three and five microns with very high QE also. Um, however, you would probably want to operate the detector in a slower uh, frame rate than 85 Hertz at those wavelengths. And so we haven't really investigated how things would behave in switching from L to M to N but our primary focus is on the N-band. Um, MIRAC has a billion filter wheel positions, so there are lots of different filters uh, to use. A nightmare if we were going to calibrate everything every run, which we're not. And the focus of our new work is to design a special ammonia filter uh, so that we could try to detect ammonia in gas giant planets that are spatially resolved from their host. In terms of sensitivity, we th if N of 13 shouldn't be a big deal at five lambda over D with a contrast of 10 to the minus four. That's sort of our benchmark goal. That should be a couple of hours on the telescope. In principle, within a night, we ought to be able to get down to N of 14. Um, our targets, you could guess, are close by anywhere from two to eight lambda over D. And while this is high contrast, it is not extreme contrast, and we're not pushing down to 10 to the minus six. We would like to, but that would require additional funding. Uh, we would need to procure in collaboration with Liège an AGPM coronagraph, the associated pupil mask, which we haven't calculated yet. And we have a path to implement the Quasit's control loop to make sure that the star can stay on the sweet spot. But these are upgrade paths. Uh, we would need additional resources to follow those paths and try to do things like NEAR did uh, to reach contrasts of 10 to the minus six or greater at a few lambda over D, say around Alpha Centauri, might be a good target. Our main science goals are to characterize known gas giants that have been discovered with GPIs and Sphere and Subaru and other high contrast imaging facilities at shorter wavelengths. And we want to be part of making the first mid-infrared detections of those objects. Again, we would like to focus on uh, uh, having a detection of ammonia in the 10 micron spectrum of some uh, gas giant planets 
This object shown here from Stephens 09 is a mid sea dwarf, and there is ammonia present, and we think we should be able to detect it with a filter photometric technique, although it will be challenging. Um, we think detecting ammonia and constraining nitrogen will be key to constraining theories of planet formation in addition to C and O. And if we can follow the upgrade path, there are some planets detected with RV where we have a good shot at detecting them in the mid-infrared, as the colleagues with NEAR also tried to do. Epsilon Indy A sub B is a good candidate, and we could also give Eps Airy a go as well. Planning protoplanets embedded in circumplanetary disks and characterizing them. I'll just remind that we've discovered some of these things with Sphere, with, uh, even with NACO in this example, three and five microns. There are compact objects and extended nebulosity in these disks. There are probably multiple emission components in these systems, a compact protoplanet, an unresolved circumplanetary disk, perhaps an infalling accretion shock, which is why you would like as broad a wavelength range as possible an SED in order to pull apart these different emission mechanisms and figure out exactly what you're studying. The project is now funded. Uh, when I spoke about this last year, it was not. Uh, we received word from the Heising Simons Foundation that we're fully funded uh, last winter and we're moving full steam ahead. Most of the hardware is in hand. The modifications to my rack are modest. We've already had the detector in the cryostat uh, last fall. And we have plans to commission on the MMT with the new MAPS adaptive optics system with uh, 336 actuators. Uh, we are somewhat slave to that schedule, but things look good. Others from Arizona can comment, but there's still a chance we can get on sky in summer 2021 for commissioning. And our plan would be then to do two science runs and then follow with a run to Magellan next year in 2022 to begin Southern Hemisphere work. Um, I want to spend a minute or two and maybe bust my time on what we hope these detectors can do for ELT. Uh, Danny already mentioned this. Um, Rory Bowen has completed a study uh, utilizing the METIS contrast curves to explore what the yield would be. I thought this would be covered in a different presentation this week, but it wasn't. Um, if you assume Kepler occurrence rates for planets as a function of radius on the y-axis, an orbital period on the x-axis, the numbers are the percentages of stars that have one or more planets in these bins. So several percents in each of these boxes. You can then imagine what the occurrence rate would be by doing a direct imaging survey around the nearest 20 stars. And you would then have to have a contrast curve that you would then project into planet radius and orbital period space using the angular separation given the distance and inclination and contrast via inclination and planet flux. And you could make these predictions. And you may recall Sasha Kvantz and, and Ian Crossfield and collaborators did this about five years ago, assuming that we were background limited at two lambda over D. That was incredibly optimistic, but you know, forward thinking. So we've redone this uh, courtesy of Christian uh, Delacroix and Olivier Opsil and Roy and others in the METIS team to provide these contrast curves. Notice that your background limited at a handful of lambda over D in the N band, maybe not till 15 lambda over D in the M band, and not until maybe 20 lambda over D in the L band. So two lambda over D was not a good assumption for these calculations. It's good to remember if you're looking for thermal emission from planets around nearby stars in thermal equilibrium with their host star, so age doesn't matter, you need to look at early type stars within six parsecs, say. We are looking at uh, EELT, so that's, we went from 66, minus 66 to 16. There are 19 candidate stars in this bin, but if you run the numbers, there are really only five or six objects that you have a good chance of seeing something around. So this is a, a bit of a shot in the dark, <coughs> but fortunately, there's a good chance. We think there's a greater than 85% chance we'd see something, at least a planet or more. The average, the expectation value is two, and there's a 31% <coughs> chance something uh, in two or more filters so we could do a characterization, get a color. Uh, this is restricted to planets smaller than four Earth radii. So they're really tiny things. One Earth, you can only really try around Alpha Sen A, but uh, up to super Earths around all five, you've got a shot. And uh, I think I'm done there, except to say that the far future is to try to do this, of course, in reflected light as well as thermal emission, 
try to look for a greenhouse by solving the radius albedo ambiguity. And that's the real tall pole that we all want to work for in the next 15, 20 years.